Evening, everyone. I see uh, I see the uh, attendees um, slowly filing in. Um, we're at about 30 of uh, approximately 150. What uh, I would like to do to uh, start is introduce myself. First and foremost, my name is, uh, for those of you who haven't yet met me, uh, David Seymour. I'm the manager of uh, member services for the Directors Guild of Canada, Ontario District Council. Um, again, I'm going to leave uh, a few minutes of uh, grace time here for everyone to come in and settle, uh, but we do have a few uh, housekeeping items I'd like to go through as that's happening. Um, uh, obviously, most important, uh, the date of the AGM. Uh, our AGM is going to be held online this year on Saturday, August the 8th, 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. There is a registration. Uh, we've sent those links out in notifications and we'll do so again, uh, that you need to uh, register prior to uh, the actual uh, date in order to attend. Uh, and very important, uh, you have to attend in order to vote online. Um, so uh, that whole process is, uh, uh, is, is an important one uh, to get on top of earlier than later. Um, for those of uh, you who are unable to attend, we do have the option of filling out proxies uh, in advance of the uh, meeting itself. And you can send us uh, your proxies uh, either digitally or mailed uh, hard copy uh, snail mail fashion to the office. We have a deadline for uh, proxy delivery of August 4th, um, which is a Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Okay. Looks like we still have quite a few people coming in. Halfway there. So I'll give it a few more moments. Um, uh, in addition to all the AGM information that I just relayed, uh, of course, you will be receiving notifications and reminders, um, both gentle and urgent, uh, from our offices uh, between now and uh, the actual date of the AGM. So uh, keep your eyes peeled on your email inbox uh, for those. Uh, for all of that information. Uh, the links to everything you do require, whether it be for the proxy or for uh, the process of online voting on the day, uh, will all be included in those, uh, in those notifications that are coming your way. I might give it a little bit more time, maybe another half minute or so. Uh, looks like we have about 70 attendees at the moment. Lots of familiar names. Okay, so uh, in true AD fashion, uh, I'm going to rush, rush that 60 seconds to 30 seconds. Uh, and what I'd like to do is um, begin uh, the event formally with a uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, so welcome everyone, attendees and panelists both. We are broadcasting from the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and later the treaty territory of the Mississauga of the Credit River. We acknowledge the treated and untreated land that all of us are inhabiting at this moment. Uh, Toronto uh, and the rest of Ontario is still home to many Indigenous people and we are glad for the opportunity uh, to work and live uh, on this land. I would also uh, like to take a moment to say that we'd uh, like to also acknowledge the imbalances uh, long endured by many of our BIPOC and LGBTQ plus colleagues. And we stand with you in allyship and inclusion against racism, violence, harassment, and all forms of discrimination. Uh, we hear you, uh, we are listening, and we look forward to working together with you to strengthen our membership's diversity and inclusivity. So with that uh, in mind, uh, we'd like to continue by introducing uh, members of tonight's panel. You will be hearing from this evening, a uh, candidate for the position of chair, Annie Bradley, Two candidates for the position of second vice chair, Tiffany Shung and Luis Mendoza. Two candidates for the position of membership chair, Teresa Ho and Jason Washington. And last but not least, uh, four candidates for the position of caucus representative for our, the art department, uh, Nazgul Goshtaspor, Glenn Charles Landry, Khan Kwach, 
and Marion Weehawk. So welcome everybody. Um, I'd also like to uh, quickly extend regrets from uh, fellow candidates who were unable to attend uh, tonight's event. Penny Charter and John Rakich, the incumbents for assistant director and for the Locations Caucus rep respectively. Uh, I'm sure they would be happy to answer any questions uh, that uh, the attendees might have for them directly following uh, this evening's event uh, and leading up to the AGM. Okay, a um, few more housekeeping notes. Uh, forgive me while I defer to my notes here. Uh, so in terms of uh, process for this evening, uh, we will hear from uh, each candidate in the order of uh, the voting slate that will occur on the day of the AGM. Each candidate's going to have about three to four minutes to address the attendees, uh, draw from their campaign speeches or, or speak directly from them. Um, what I will ask of all of the attendees is that you please hold your questions until after all of the candidates have finished their speeches. Uh, there will be a Q&A period at the end, and during which time you can kind of send questions via the Q&A function on Zoom, or uh, you can virtually raise your hand for an opportunity to ask that question directly. Um, when asking questions, uh, please indicate which candidate the question is for, uh, or whether it's a question for all of the candidates openly. Uh, if you could also indicate your department and um, as well as your name when you're asking those questions, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and of, of course, please keep your questions uh, respectful and appropriate and on point. So without further ado, I will turn the mic over to our current chair, Alan Golubov, who will say a few words of welcome and then act as the moderator for the remainder of the evening. Thanks so much, Alan. David, thank you very much. Uh, as always, well-spoken and uh, to the point, and thank you for uh, all, all of your comments and the introduction of our uh, candidates that are in front of us. So I, I just, uh, I, I wanna welcome everybody. I mean, it's all, obviously we've never done this before. So um, at, at in, in the way in, in the way that we normally do it, we would be all be in the same room, and and we will, you know, we will attempt to try and um, reflect that kind of environment that we've had in recent years, where we have, um, you know, interesting dialogue between those that are running and wishing to serve the organization, and and those membership, those members that are out there like yourselves, uh, that want to know more and want to get a, get a sense of. Um, uh, who the candidates are what their what their issues are or what the thing what you know, what is keen for them, what is mo most interesting to them to move forward. So it's, it's a unique time. We all know it's a unique time in our industry. We have had stellar growth in both membership and production over many, many years up until four months ago and where the world has changed dramatically. Uh, the, certainly the hope for all of us is that production will and is right now slowly getting back to normal, but it, it is going to take some time before we reach uh, the levels of production that we we knew only a few months ago. So there are challenges. There's challenges for the industry clearly, uh, and there's there will be challenges for the new board. Uh, a, a lot has been accomplished in in, in recent years uh, by by the present board, uh, and you know, and it's exciting to me, someone who has been long serving the organization, to see so many people who are keen to actually get into leadership roles because decisions get made. I and mean, those that end up sitting on the board make decisions that affect the livelihood and the health and well-being of all of us. So it's important to those of you that are watching that you, you think about that and, and, you know, and question the candidates accordingly and, and understand that uh, the elected board does have uh, uh, importance to all of us. So it's, it's, it's valuable that we um, you know, populate our board uh, with people that we know are caring. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting anybody in front of me uh, doesn't. Obviously, people that have put themselves forward uh, do care and want to be more involved. And it is thrilling to me uh, to see uh, the level of interest uh, with, within the membership. The fact that we have over 100 people here today, um, and, and probably as many people to this point have already registered to, to, for the AGM, which is coming up uh, in two and a half weeks, it is remarkable. Uh, we have a huge membership. We have 3,000 members, and um, you know the board has a responsibility to all of them. And uh, so, without further ado, I say uh, thank you all. Um, I will. I'm going to be more more than anything. I'm just going to be tr sitting here, um, you know, trying to to move the evening forward. We have a, roughly an hour and a half. Uh, the candidates who are in front of you are each are going to speak, as David pointed out, three or four minutes. 
uh, I'm going to keep track as best I can with my three minute egg timer um, so that people who don't get, don't get overly long winded. I mean, I will not cut you off, but I will certainly uh, forewarn you that, you know, you're getting close to uh, time. And that's really to allow uh, the, the membership that are out there to have time to ask the questions. So uh, I suspect it's going to take us up roughly a half hour for the candidates to, to speak to you all. And, uh, and as David said, I pre we'd appreciate that you hold all of your questions uh, until all the candidates have had an opportunity to speak to you. So um, with, without fur further ado, and for those that have come in a little later from uh, the, uh, David's intro, uh, the candidates are going to be speaking in the order that they are going to be on the ballot uh, in, ten, in, in two and a half weeks. So, uh, and the first uh, um, uh, election that we'll be addressing at the AGM will be for uh, the chair of uh, DGC Ontario. And I introduce you to Annie Bradley, who presently sits on the board and uh, is, is uh, put her name forward to represent us as our chair. So Annie, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, and welcome everybody. Uh, we're up to like 92 attendees right now, so that's very exciting. Um, I'd like to say thank you also to all of my fellow um, panelists who are also put their hat in the ring to run. It's incredibly encouraging to see this engagement and uh, I hope for uh, this level of engagement in years to come. Um, my name is Annie Bradley. I am a director member for those of you who don't know me. I've also been a first AD, um, so I've also been sitting, I've also been an AD caucus rep, or an AD caucus member as well in previous years. Um, currently, I represent you on the DGC board as a second vice chair. And after a lot of careful consideration and consulting with many people, I decided to uh, run for the position of chair of the board of the Directors Guild of Ontario. And that was a decision that was not taken lightly as it is a very um, important job. And we have an exemplary uh, example of a chair, Alan Golubov, who I've been happy to mentor under for the last two years. And as well, we have an incredible amount of board members, many of who will be still on your board in the next election. And they are experienced deeply in their fields and they are wonderful people and they very care, care very much about the organization and the decisions that we make. Um, it has been encouraging to see Ontario's growth prior to COVID um, as an internationally respected and desirable workforce, but also as a community that encourages diversity, inclusion, and philanthropy. And this has always been three things that are very important to me, and I believe that they're very important to the membership at large. Um, it's an exciting time for the DGC as we transition to new leadership and in the fall, our new home, our membership hub, and our training, new training facility will allow us to enhance our slate of training, expand our networking events when we can all get together. And I look forward to your thoughts on how the new facilities can best benefit the membership, you, the membership. Fostering our international marketing efforts has never been more important as when we move back into working post COVID and the possibility of bringing up of keys to Ontario may seem a little bit more daunting than usual. And I am hoping that this provides a lot of opportunities for our memberships and our keys that would that may perhaps be of more benefit to us than previous years when it, it's very simple to bring up uh, American directors, production designers, editors, um, first ADs, et cetera. So I'm hoping that that is, uh, creates a growth for all of our membership. Um, I think that sometimes this year has taught us a lot about how we can do better. And I think we've all, during this pause, had a chance to reflect on having a work-life balance, um, considering social justice issues. And um, I think that the Guild, what I wanna say is that the Guild has heard you and we are listening and we can do better and we must do better. And so I look forward to working on our outreach programs for our membership to build a more diverse and inclusive guild. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie, for those words. Um, moving now to uh, uh, Tiffany, uh, I'll let you take the uh, microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, and hello, everybody out there in the ether. My name is Tiffany Schoen. I'm a Toronto-based director, and I was so honored and surprised and thrilled to have been nominated for the DGC position of the second vice chair and to run. Um, 
I had thought about it in previous years, but I guess never thought about having that confidence and that push. And so to to be nominated really feels great to have that support. And and I know I could learn a wealth of so much from Annie from being from the second uh, chair position prior. And so I. I may have met you briefly during an AGM intermission or locked up during jury duty debating nominations for the DGC awards or more likely at one of the DGC's infamous TIFF parties where we both tried to get an extra drink ticket from Hans. And if we haven't met yet, I'm excited to meet you soon. Um, in my 12 years as a documentary filmmaker, innovation has always been at the core of my endeavors. I have had the privilege of being at the forefront of international national initiatives and served as a cultural ambassador for the Aeroplan Beyond Miles program. And for eight years, I've been a board member of Schools Without Borders and sat on a three-year term for the grant review team for Outreach Toronto. And I'm currently a board member of the Ontario chapter for the Documentary Organization of Canada. As a DGC Director Caucus member, I've witnessed admirable leadership at both the national and district levels. And I want to be part of that leadership team where efforts and initiatives reflect the growth of our of the rights of our membership and further drives equity, access, and opportunity. Um, I've had many conversations with Warren since the first time I joined, and his actions and his leadership as well has been something that I've been following carefully and also learning and really feeling like wanting to also step up to the plate as well. We are witnessing history in the making right now, and despite COVID-19, we're seeing how communities strive and advocate for change, making an important time to foster effective transformation. Some parts of our society might finally be moving beyond the lip service and empty promises of the past. Let's hope. <laughs> I believe in the DGC board that reflects diversity, honors the talent and knowledge of its members and collectively works through its challenges. In electing me as your second vice chair, you're committing to strengthening your allyship with support of the BIPOC communities and that make up our industry. One of my key goals is to champion the concerns and aspirations of our members, especially our new members, so that they feel seen and heard. I'll ensure that the documentary community is represented at the table and further the vital discussions and efforts to support mental health issues. As a member of the LGBTQ2S community, I want members to be able to comfortably voice their concerns and ideas to the Guild so that we can collectively strive for safety and inclusivity both within our organization and in the film industry. When I first started out as a filmmaker, I was lucky enough to have mentors who gave me their time, advice, and encouragement. And as your second vice chair, you would allow me to give back in the same way and help move the industry forward. I would build on the incredible initiatives that are currently in place by strengthening the connections of our membership to other parallel fields. The second vice chair position will be demanding and challenging role. However, I've never been more passionate and ready to turn the vast spectrum of interests, needs, and visions of the DGC membership into opportunities for our community. Thank you so much, everybody. Tiffany, thank you very much. It was nice to, nice to hear from you. I don't know that we have met, but I, I look forward to it when that opportunity arises. Um, next up is uh, Luis Mendoza. Thank you, Alan. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the candidates here today. I think this uh, screen reflects the diversity and the interest for, from all kinds of people. Um, numbers that I, we haven't seen uh, as big in, in a long time. So I'm very happy, uh, especially uh, my, my friend Tiffany, thank you for running. I appreciate you being here. Best of luck to you and hopefully uh, one of us will represent everyone uh, to the best of our abilities. So uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Luis Mendoza. Um, I'm currently the, the National Locations Caucus Rep, been doing so for the last six years. I'll be stepping down from that position and not for anything other than the fact that I think it's some, uh, time for somebody else, uh, which uh, will free up my time um, should I uh, be elected to serve at the Ontario Board, which I also serve in the past as a Locations Caucus Rep for six years. So I'm quite familiar and comfortable with the position, um, uh, the workings of the board. And to me, it's, uh, it's all about the members. It's, it's not about uh, anything other than thinking of those who are actually out there being uh, present, who need some help. Um, we, we definitely need to, lead, to do outreach to all kinds of different uh, groups. However, uh, our members are also very important. They need support, they need uh, um, to be heard. And so uh, for me, 
it really, it really isn't about, you know, saying all the promises and you know, all the things that I'm going to do. It is about um, rolling with the punches. Right now we're in very difficult times, uh, unlike ever before. So I, I feel that uh, the last few years, especially in the last year, as a board member at the national level, has given me a little bit of uh, uh, experience in terms of uh, having a cool head to deal with, with, with the issues that we're facing. So uh, I don't want to go too much into what I will do. I think it's about what needs to be done right now based on our current circumstances, what the members need. And once we get over the hump, then we can start thinking about all the outreach that we need to do and how to best uh, serve all of our members as a whole. So don't think I want to say much more other than, you know, best of luck to all of you guys. Thank you. Louise, thank you very much. Um, moving on, Teresa, Teresa Ho, um, I'll give you the floor now for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. And thanks everyone for coming out on this momentous occasion. It's incredible that we're doing this all by Zoom. Um, wow. I just want to introduce myself. I'm Teresa Ho and I'm running for the membership chair of DGC Ontario. Um, I've been a 20 year member and I know some of you might look at me and go, oh, you joined when you're 12? No, I've been around. <laughs> I started in the accounting caucus and I recently joined the PM caucus. Um, through the accounting caucus, I've worked with many of you and from pre-production to production and well into post. I've had lots of discussions with you about your work concerns, your life concerns, even played tennis with some of you. Um, I've raised a, a kid as a single parent, so I know the challenges, what it's like to be in this industry as a single parent. And I see what my child faces, um, figuring out his path as a young adult, and I want to help. I've also been a volunteer um, on a number of boards and committees. Um, Regent Park Film Festival, I was the pre past treasurer and board member. And so my experience on those boards will help me on this one. You might ask why I wanna do this. Well, I know that mentorship and training is so important to the members. I've been a teacher on the budgeting course, met many of you who want to progress into production managers and production accountants. I've also taken courses, I've done editing courses, post-production, AD scheduling, leadership training, and I know that training across departments is so important to progress this membership. But the most standout moment in my career, most recently, has been a conversation with a young Asian woman while I was on set, and she was a participant, and she said to me in wonderment, you're the production manager? as if she never thought until she saw me that someone like her could be in that role. And I want to be a face that leads new memberships to see that, to show that DGC can represent Ontario, an Ontario that's diverse. That when people look at me, they see that leadership in film and television can be my face. Why might, why might I want to do it now? Well, I remember seeing last year an initiative that was brought up um, through the POV Third Street program for a diverse um, PA membership. And I want to thank everyone who took part in that, um, including Joanne Barrington, who's the current uh, membership chair. But I want to lead more of those kinds of initiatives because I know that new faces and new voices will help elevate this membership. And we need more, and I wanna be there for more. We, the members who lift up the members who are growing and expanding so that they can lift up the new members who come into the DGC. I want to create a mentorship program for current members and new ones. And I wanna support the training for all members to ensure we stay competitive. We need to work together and show our strengths. We're award-winning crews, award-winning key creatives, and award-winning directors. It's important that the world knows this, and I'm here to shout it out. Thanks for your time. Be brave. Vote for me August 8th. Uh, Teresa, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, moving on, Jason uh, Washington, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, Jason Washington, I'm uh, a career AD with the organization. Uh, first joined as a member back in 2002, at which point in time Annie was briefly a First City mentor when I did my GAP class all the way back then, so I've known Annie for quite a while. Um, I was previously the uh, elected AD rep for two terms from 2014 to 2018. Um, this right now is my fourth election. I did run two years ago as the second vice chair, which uh, Annie did beat me in, um, but it was great. And I love that because you do need to have a vibrancy in the, in the board. And right now I'm running again to be your membership and training chair. And the, uh, the reason is, is um, I learned a lot as an AD rep. Um, you know, I took us through two rounds of collective bargaining um, because really the, the core of the organization is still about that contract is what dictates um, how we work, um, why we work and everything else and everything builds from that. Uh, and the other pillars of what the board does is um, really dealing with the hiring of the senior staff, the guidance of that staff and the office of the organization. Um, and that leads us to, to really our most important thing, which is the intake of, of membership and the growth of membership. And you know, right now we've been talking about the need to get more diverse, which is, is critical. Um, and because of that, we need to do two things, which are one, uh, attracting uh, new members starting off their careers, as well as looking for avenues on how do we attract um, more experienced members uh, who can better represent. You know, and that possibly means looking um, outside of the country as well. You know, Canada is a great environment to immigrate to. Um, we're great centers to work with both Ontario and, and elsewhere. And so there's a need. Um, I was in Australia for uh, December, January visiting family, but I spent a lot of time talking to various um, state film governments there, uh, especially South Australia and New South Wales, um, to see what they're doing to attract people as well in some of the programs. And they started great initiatives to, to sponsor storytelling amongst the indigenous communities, um, against the minority communities as well. So it's, uh, there's a lot of good things happening. And again, people are gonna ask, how can I you know, represent um, being Caucasian? Um, I grew up overseas. Um, my mother's a Canadian diplomat, so I grew up in a, in a variety of countries, both first world, second world, third world. And that gave me a strong introduction to a variety of cultures. So I grew up with friends who weren't just like me, they represented everything else. So I had Tamil friends in Sri Lanka. I had Pakistani friends when I lived in Brussels. Um, so you learn to see the world in a very different place. Um, I'm also a son of a single mother. Um, you know, my mother had me young and needed support to grow and thrive, and she turned into a four-time ambassador for Canada. And so I also want to look at other initiatives, like how do we help things? Um, you know, we have a lot of young members now with families, and they need uh, family support. I had lunch with a friend of mine today, and they're struggling with childcare. So they not only have to come back from COVID, now they're dealing with how, how do we navigate through all this. Um, we're a very rich industry, therefore we have means, therefore we need to look uh, at doing more. I have a female DP friend of mine who we had the, the active conversation about. She was worried, I'm pregnant now, is that gonna stall my career? So we need to look for ways and mechanisms so that that becomes a no answer. And we have the means collectively as a group to do that. Another initiative I want to look at, which is, is not a, a direct member initiative, but a, a secondary one is, we're coming back, we're going to thrive. Our fellow members in the stage industries are not. They're under a lot of uh, tough situations right now. But they were also a good training and feeder ground for me. I'm who I am because of my time in theater and stage. And there's a heavy amount of our membership that are where they are now because of, of that uh, side and that situation. So what can we do to help them you know, in the long run as well? So. Those are the sorts of things. Um, and again, I just want to say thank you for letting me run and represent you. Uh, and again, ask your questions away because we're here to support you. All right. J Jason, thank you. Uh, sorry, Naz, thank you for taking the floor. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, to this Zoom um, event. Um, as some of you know, or don't know, my name is Naz. I'm a production designer with the Guild. I've joined the Guild in 2006 when industry was dead and kind of worked my way up the ladder throughout the years and um, it, to the position of the production designer. 
And I'm really happy to see how far the Guild has come over the last few years, especially with the initiative they're taking to promote the art, uh, all the departments, especially the production design department, and you know, presenting us in Canada as well as the States. Um, but a lot of things I've heard in the past is also, what has the Guild done for me? And you know, and I've been guilty of that as well. And I want to kind of help facilitate that and help change that. And one of the things that I would like to do uh, if I'm elected is uh, really um, uh, create a more transparent uh, communication between the Guild and the caucus and uh, share, pro um, share the process and the information with you and hopefully give you a better understanding of what the Guild's limitations are and what we have accomplished and what we can do moving forward and how we can overcome the barriers that are in our way in order to achieve what we want to achieve. Um, another part of uh, my platform would be that I reached out to you guys, uh, some of you separately before I decided to run and I asked, um, you know, what can we do for you? What can the uh, Guild do for the art department? And a lot of times the kid fee came up and, and I know this and I've experienced it firsthand and I know, you know, certain productions would put a cap on kit fee and what I want to do is um, make sure that kit fees become a man mandatory thing as part of our deal memo, as part of our agreement when we're uh, signing on to a production and there's no kit fee or there's uh, no cap as we do want the kit fee. Um, and after the pandemic, um, the city is going to get busier and busier. And oftentimes what we've done, what we've run into in the past is running out of uh, first assistants, art directors, uh, you know, running out of crew very uh, quickly. And it's part of me. I love the Guild is reaching out to different organizations, universities, high schools. Um, then they have different programs and they do uh, talks with the organizations to bring um, awareness to what the film industry is, especially what the art department is. And I want to be able to do more of that. And I know um, the Guild, they do their best to do what they can to get the word out, but there's only so many days they can go out and promote the, um, promote our industry. And I want to be able to uh, maybe come up with a committee that would help ask our members, uh, different members of the art department to go out and spread the word. Um, another thing I've done, I, I would like to do in the, um, if I'm elected is uh, hopefully include more members while uh, during TIFF and during CSAs, not just those whose works have been selected, but other members of the art department to the events of the Guild. And I would like to um, propose uh, creating an exhibition, a rotating exhibition, exhibition and working with the City of Toronto to create this uh, exhibition in a high traffic space to promote to the city what you know our film industry is doing, bring parts of sets and um, and uh, and all of that and um, and that's all and I hope I can count on your vote vote on August seventh or eighth. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Naz. Uh, yeah, August eighth. For those that are listening out there, it's not the seventh. Uh, the AGM is on the eighth. Um, so, uh, Glenn, we're Glenn, take it away, please. Uh, bonsoir tout le monde. My name is Glenn Charles Landry. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, I've been in the Guild since 2011. Um, but before that, I, I've been actually a designer of film, TV, and theater uh, since uh, 1998. Uh, I remember doing my first film, work on my first film in 1998, uh, Rédéric Jean Faux Blas. And I was basically the assistant to everyone. Uh, I was uh, doing FX, uh, I was the smoke guy, I was the painter, the assistant set deck, assistant, assistant props, assistant everything, literally. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I'm a curious person. I like to go see and learn stuff. And uh, that's what has uh, helped me uh, get me where I'm at. I, I'm always wanting to find out more, uh, make myself better and make people around me better. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, I'm here because I think uh, the art department needs more respect. And I remember uh, Alan, I think it was last year at an AGM, you said, because the art department is now has the most memberships that uh, we can start running the DGC. 
And I think it's time that we start running the DGC for us. Um, we have amazing talent in our caucus. Uh, we have amazing talent in coming up. And I want to be part of that. I want to be part of mentoring. Uh, I want to be part of moving our values and our ideas forward. Uh, I want to be part of showing off who we are to the world, to the country, and to our province. Um, I had the privilege of working with Marion uh, when Diana came out and said uh, she wanted art directors and production designers to, to create this group of people to start figuring out a document on how we would deal with COVID-19 in the art department. So uh, I instantly wanted to know more, wanted to be part of it, wanted to be at the forefront. Uh, so uh, Marion and I worked on it uh, and we created this great document. You'll see it, uh, Diana did a great job. A bunch of people did an amazing job. And we are at the forefront of trying to keep our crew safe in a healthy environment uh, and we hope to have put these measures, these protocols, these ideas forward for our, our membership. Now, uh, if you've ever worked for me, you know that uh, I fight for my crew. Um, I'm somebody that defends them. I'm somebody that kind of becomes a bouncer, a buffer. Uh, and that's what I want to become for the art department. I want to become somebody that you can come talk to, somebody that you can come see. Uh, somebody that uh, if you need help in any way, I'll figure out a way or try to figure or send you to somebody that might know if I don't know. Uh, that's why I want to be your rep. I want to defend you. I want to fight for you. I want to make the art department better, bigger, stronger. And that's why you should vote for me. Thank you. Glenn, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to hear from you. Um, uh, moving on to uh, Khan, please. Thanks, Alan. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. Uh, my name is Khan, and for those of you who do not know me, I am from Saigon, Vietnam. Um, I've been in the guild for six years. I specialize in set design, but I am now currently art directing Titan season three. Um, given everything that happened recently, uh, I think this is a very important election year for all of us and I am very happy and, on, uh, and honored to be a part of this. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read my letter yet, there are three key things that I would like to focus on. Um, as we all know, the biggest thing that happened this year is COVID and it will definitely affect the renegotiation, renegotiation of our contracts next year. Um, I'm sure we've been all thinking about the past four months, how are we going back to work safely and what that will look like. Uh, this pandemic has already changed the way every industry will work going forward, and we're certainly no different. I think as a union, we need to ask ourselves what we need to do to adapt uh, moving forward. One of the ways could be to re-examine the 12-hour hour work day model. And to me, and also I'm sure for a lot of people here as well, this goes beyond COVID because there's been talk about this for a very long time and you know where, whether or not it's a healthy work-life balance or not. Um, a few of my colleagues and I have been doing some research and we take, we've been taking a closer look at the wage structure and talking to accountants and producers just to really understand the impact of reducing the work hours and, that would, and, that, and how that would look like. Um, so that is currently in the work. And my second point of my campaign is BIPOC representation and workplace inclusion. Um, as I'm sure we're all aware, global protests over the past couple of months have been sparking lots of positive changes, which is very exciting. And last month, Tim Sutton sent a letter highlighting that the DTC has been supporting research on diversity and inclusion. Um, I think this research will actually be very helpful for us to understand the discrepancy between BIPOC members and white members within our caucus. Uh, and with this information, I hope to create an actionable plan for the art department to support and uplift our members of color. Um, my third and final point is career and professional development. Uh, because of COVID, most of us will be working from home safely. Uh, and it certainly will diminish 
the mentorship that members often get from working together in person. Uh, I can certainly speak from experience that I learned a lot from just going around and asking questions uh, from senior members in the office about just their workflows, design tips and tricks and so on. Um, I mean, it's certainly not, not impossible now, but it's definitely a lot more difficult. So as a part of the solution, I'd like to propose a masterclass series just to help with nurturing the talent of our members going forward. Um, and as an end note, I would like to say thank you for the nomination and support that I've been receiving. And I'm looking forward to the next two years working with everyone if I get elected. Uh, my goal is to be available and approachable so that we could all work together to achieve our vision. Thanks very much. Khan, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, moving on to uh, Marion Weehack. You've got the floor, Marion. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel and also hello to everyone out there. Um, some of you may know me. Um, so where are we now? I think there's been obviously two crucial shifts uh, that has already been, uh, have already been mentioned uh, many times uh, this evening. But those two shifts since February when I agreed to throw my hat in the ring are, of course, COVID and the long overdue embrace of the BIPOC communities. Uh, in addition to this is the fact that there are big changes already happening in the DTC Ontario and that's, um, you know, as has been, been mentioned, Alan Galliboff stepping down from his decades plus of invaluable and effective leadership. So thank you so much, Alan, uh, your big shoes to fill and thank you so much to Annie for stepping up to the plate because I think it's an exciting thing that's going to happen. And so all these big changes obviously bring the chance for new opportunities and I think that the most effective DGC will encompass a blend of the longstanding experience and overview, as well as new energy and actions. So why did I put my hat in the ring and who am I? Um, I'm a 30 year member of DGC, 30 plus or minus. Um, and I was working in the industry long before the explosion of production that most of you have become familiar with and think is commonplace, not counting the last four months. Um, prior to working within the guild, I was at CBC as an assistant and then a designer. And uh, then I moved to DGC and I worked on big Hollywood films and I worked on some you know, smaller films. And I really steered my boat towards uh, Canadian independent films because I actually really believed in them and loved them. And I still do. That said, I've worked on a range of projects over the years. So in all this time, I've seen and experienced a lot. I've been through the setbacks of the recession in 2007, 2009, uh, SARS in 2003, um, the actor strike in 2007, and just the peaks and valleys of a long career. And sure, it's been a challenge at times, absolutely, but um, I'm resilient and I love what I do. Like I really do love the profession and I hope you do too. Um, back in January, it was suggested to me that the scope of my insight and experience would be a valuable asset to the DGC moving forward. And I thought about this, it wasn't my immediate um, go to, but on thinking about it, I realized that no, I do have a lot of experience and to offer and I can offer guidance and overview as we head into this actually now very challenging, brave and exciting period in the organization. Um, one of those things I've been doing as, as Glenn mentioned, I've been working with the Toronto, no, the DGC Ontario Art Department COVID Safety Working Group. Uh, and we've been devising recommendations to help ensure a safe, healthy, fair, and creative working environment in a COVID world. The focus has been specific for Art Department protocols and concerns. And though it remains unclear, I think, how long our world and our industry will have to deal with these COVID related adjustments, because, you know, hopefully it isn't forever. Um, Yet discussions about, for example, shortened shooting days have been increasing in, within the industry across North America for several years. This isn't a new conversation. And certainly now with the importance of immunity and safety being paramount, the conversation takes new prominence. And so I, I, I nod to the, the initiatives that Khan and, and your colleagues have been actually forming a group to start discussing it, because it is something that I think uh, warrants a, a, a real focused conversation. Um, regarding the BIPOC uh, committee that the Guild has created, um, I worked with R.T. Thorne. Um, I don't know him well, but I worked with him in 2010 and 2011 
on his city life slash remix projects and he's a guy of vision and drive and initiative and it's really exciting that he is heading up the BIPOC uh, committee at the guild and he's just the kind of person who bre breeds and thinks of all sorts of inclusive and uh, modes of outreach so anyway regardless of whether I'm the caucus rep or not I look forward to working with RT within this initiative within the guild. Um, my objectives, uh, to boil them down, um, is obviously embracing and uh, working to realize these two necessary shifts and to ensure that every member um, of the art department feels valued and validated. This is fundamentally really important to me, that whether you're working on a tier A, mega series, big film, or whether you're working on a tier F indie film, or whether you're even in a, an, on a non-union dispensation with the endorsement of the Guild, you're important, you're contributing member to this industry and and your voice is important and the work you do is important so i really really am passionate about that to uh, making sure that everyone feels validated in that way um, also uh, providing mentorship to gap members and new members into the guild and hopefully there'll be many more new ones now um, whether production designers wanting a greater representation in terms of uh, foreign permits, though that, because of the COVID situation, is less of a concern right now, but it has been in the past. Um, so, and also heading towards the um, 2021 um, new Guild Basic Agreement negotiations, it's a very important time, as, as it's been mentioned already. And so I think it's very important that we, as a large caucus in the art department, um, gather that wish list of advisements uh, moving forward towards that. And I will definitely, uh, be really passionate about you know, modifying that so that we have a cogent and compelling pitch to make at that during those negotiations. There's other considerations that have paled somewhat in, in, in light of COVID and the BIPOC uh, initiatives, but they are um, DGC training programs, especially, okay, do I, am I getting cut off? Yeah. <laughs> Two, 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 two more seconds. Okay, so it's the training programs, which also have been mentioned, and especially with us working remotely, there's lots of things to learn, as is it important to create that connectivity that we'll lose because of remote working, so some kind of art department blog or website, perhaps. And anyway, sustainability, I just have to throw this in there. We were on such a good route heading into before COVID in terms of like, whether it was water bottles or no plastic bags or whatever, and it's just, it's really, sad with a backseat that has all taken in light of all the other concerns but it, it, you know we are no better position and i think it's important for us to still embrace ways to be sustainable because we are ultimately such a wasteful industry in many different ways so in summary um i will commit to fostering a place where all voices are seen and heard and my prevailing hope is that you love what you do and that you're represented by an organization that makes you feel like you belong thank you Marianne, thank you very much. And, 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 and to, to all of you, thank you for all of your uh, thoughts, all of your um, uh, energy that, uh, that I feel that you want to bring forward. And I, just, I have to make one comment. You know, Teresa mentioned that she was 12 years old when she joined the Guild. Well, I actually was 12 years old when I joined the Guild in 1976, when I think we had 200 members. We now have 5,000 members. So, so in, in the span of my membership, and I, you know, I mean, I, I guess I was 12, maybe I was 13 when I joined the Guild, but, but, you know, we've come a long way as an organization and we've grown and we've matured and, and, and the comments that all of you are making is, is just a reflection of the energy that's out there and the appetite and desire for, for, for people that want to serve this organization and the membership. Um, uh, again, I said earlier, I couldn't be more pleased and I, and I know many of us that have have been engaged in a long for a long time in the guild are, are are thrilled with what's going on with the guild in spite of the last four months which we will somehow work our way through because that's what we do as, as film workers um so uh right now we're going to open up the floor and uh, david uh you're going to take take and bring forward the questions and uh, we will get at it and uh um for the next uh, 45 minutes or so Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, just as a gentle reminder for those attendees uh, who uh, started with us at seven o'clock uh, and uh, a little update uh, for those people who joined a little later, uh, we will have a Q&A period now. Uh, what that will entail is uh, you posing questions either via the Q&A function at the bottom menu of your Zoom 
or uh, by raising your hand. And we will attend to those raised hands uh, in uh, order of uh, their raising. Um, if, you, uh, if you don't mind, uh, if you can identify yourself by name and also by department or job category, uh, that would be terrific. As well, please do indicate in your question who your question is directed to or whether it's a question op to open to all candidates. Uh, without further ado, uh, I will begin uh, with our first question from uh, Matt Middleton. Uh, so uh, Matt Middleton, production designer, art director, uh, has a question for the, uh, the candidates of the uh, Art Caucus representatives, uh, Glenn, Naz, Marion, and Khan. I applaud you for making the commitment to run to represent the art department. May the best win. However, if you do not, what role do you think you can take in the art department to support the elected rep and further develop ideas and initiatives for the art department membership? Alan, you're, you're muted. Right, we'll go in that order, Naz. Um, well, uh, first of all, Matt, I, I really like what, you've, uh, what you did in the past as the art department uh, representative. And um, as you would know, I always like to volunteer my time to the guild, whether it's uh, interviewing applicants uh, to join the guild or going out and speaking to uh, the students, anything I can do to spread the word out. I will continue to do that to make sure that our representative is supported and um you know uh, and if i have any ideas i will bring it up to them and i will continue to talk to the uh, art department members and see what the guild can do basically the same thing i would do if i was elected but you know not an, as a, not a, as an elected representative you know my time i always donated to the guild so i'm happy to continue doing that and even more of it uh glenn so uh, yeah, um, uh, as in the past, when Peter Mahaychuk was uh, the head, I Peter and I had talked about me being his assistant. There was a, at one point having possibly two art department uh, people. So uh, I would definitely, uh, again, whoever uh, win, uh, if I don't win, uh, would offer to be like a second to them uh, to help them out. Um, I, like I said, I've been offering my, my time to the COVID-19. Uh, I've helped mentorship people. Uh, I have been able, just because of timing, but I've also been off, asked to uh, be part of those um, those interviews, uh, and I love doing it. I love meeting other people, uh, love, uh, trying to help them. Uh, I've helped a few people get into the, uh, the guild, uh, art, direct, uh, art departments. So I just continue what I'm doing now, just, uh, you know, basically, uh, just to help out the, the, the guild, which I've been doing. Thanks. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Khan, a comment? Uh, yeah, so I I do but so I do believe that it would certainly help uh, to increase diversity if there is a diverse panel when it comes to the intake process. So I would like to be a part of that um, going forward. And because I specialize in set design, so I and I'm really passionate about it. And I would love to you know create a mentorship program where I can actually work with younger, newer members um, that want to get into the field as well. Thank you. Con, thank you. Uh, Marian. Um, I think, I, I, as, as the, the, my colleagues have said, uh, taking part in whatever initiatives are important. At this point in time, I believe that one of the most important things will be forming a, a group that comes up with these advisements for the um, early 2021 negotiations. So being part of a group that helps formulate the, the language or the ideas, was very important. And so going over to Glenn's thought of being like an assistant to whoever the caucus rep is, that it has occurred to me that that might, if we are such a large caucus, it might not be a bad idea to actually have two people, uh, especially in this time of transition. And when there's like, there's the, there's the regular things that we want to think about in terms of the large picture, but there's also these short term challenges as well. So I'd be happy to be part of that kind of um, energy as well. Marion, thank you very much. Uh, David, another question out there? Uh, certainly. Uh, we have a question from Barry Greenwald from the director uh, member, director caucus. The documentary genre employs in DGC Ontario many guild members. What will you do to best represent Ontario guild documentary directors, editors, and all our crafts and caucus members that work in the documentary genre to support us? Uh, that question goes out to all candidates. 
If I could take a stab first, uh, Dave. That's okay. Um, as an Ontario um, board member for our, uh, DOC Canada, um, I've been so blessed to be able to work and meet incredible board members in that chapter, but also have the access and ability to really truly understand the landscape of documentary in Canada today. Film made with the National Film Board of Canada again, um, having been very involved in the documentary community. But on top of that, most importantly, is that um, I've been a mentor and a facilitator to emerging filmmakers in the doc community for over eight, almost 10 years now. And I think that has given me the ability to offer support and leverage understanding of what is going on right now in, in Ontario, in Canada, across and really internationally in terms of the challenges that documentary filmmakers um, face and I'll go through. I did mention in um, my opening intro there, I talked about mental health because I, I do think that's something that um, often with documentary filmmakers, we really, you know, really put ourselves out there. It's slightly masochistic in many ways, but I think that's really important to truly understand all the levels and areas in which um, not only doc filmmakers, but even editors and people in that production have to go through. And I think that that's something that I really want to champion and bring to the table and speak to that because something that I personally constantly experience as well, but as well as colleagues and peers and, and people that I mentor as well. And, and so I'm excited that I sit on this board and I'm excited to be able to bridge that gap between the DGC and uh, Doc Canada. And I think that there can be exciting in initiatives that we can build together foster those types of uh, changes and, and be able to best represent that community. Tiffany, thank you very much. I don't know, Annie, if, if you have a comment there or, I mean, and every, all these questions, it, it doesn't mean that everybody on the panel needs to answer every question. I don't feel that you, you know, unless it's specifically asked. So it's, but thank you, Tiffany, for, for your comments. And I, I, I don't know if, if uh, Annie, you wish to, to speak to the doc question. Yeah, I think that, I mean, Barry, I am, thank you for your question. And I am a member of the Director's Caucus. And I do know that many of our new members are also doc members. And I think that it's an emerging, ca it's an emerging category that for a very long time um, has sort of been at the side of um, the landscape. Um, and also too, you know, with the advent of COVID and the uncertain future of film festivals and, and you know, uh, sales and everything else, I think it's even more relevant now than it ever has been before. So I, you know, I would support, and you know, Tiffany, I would support any, you know, initiatives and ideas that people have to to strengthen that that workforce, and to also to look at ways that we can that we can help across the board. Because I know we also have a large majority of our director members that when they're starting out, just like I did, we work in a docudrama uh, landscape as well, and that's where we we you know hone our craft and get our hours. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion around that that needs to be had in the future going forward. That's what I would say. Annie, thanks. Um, David? Oh, oh, sorry, Jason, you uh, comment there? Yeah, no, I was just going to say to, to, you know, carry on with that and also to carry on to, to other categories as well. Like I've always believed strongly in um, if you're working in this business, regardless of the genre, it, it's better to be covered, therefore you can be protected. You know, as a storyteller, you want to be able to focus on, on telling that story. You don't want to have to worry about, you know, everything else beyond that, your financial protection, because we've all worked for companies doing docudramas, documentaries, or non-union, where we haven't been paid, or payment comes so ridiculously late. Um, you want to have the protection of, of being within the workplace as well. Um, you know, I've argued for years about um, more protection and the animation side of things, um, you know, as well. And so by strengthening our contract, like we as an organization, our strength comes from um, being able to, to acquire multitude of, of talent, um, being able to acquire a multitude of projects and productions we work on. And as well, too, there are a lot of uh, shows that typically never signed DGC contracts that thrived because they incorporated not just DGC members, but members from the other unions as well. Um, you know, and sometimes they, they suffered because of that. And so we're better when we can grow and to include, you know, and I also think about things like, you know, visual effects as well, stop motion animation. These are video games, maybe even these are huge industries that, you know, we should be a part of. And if they use our people, we should have a better. It's 
20 hours. Um, Louise. Yeah, um, you know, through the years, we've always had a specific department, a specific issue, uh, a group of people that have has needed help at the time. I think it's important to understand that this organization has always been focused focused on the, on, on the issues at the moment, but let's not forget that there's many, many departments. The energy shouldn't go to one specific department. It should be as a whole, but definitely there's always uh, a weaker area that needs the strength and the support from the board. So, you know, uh, as a location member, I'm familiar with most of the, uh, the departments, what they're, the essence of each department. Uh, some of them I don't understand fully, like I'm sure that you won't, but the one important thing is to actually um, understand that, for example, for you guys running for the art department, um, I think it's great all, all the initiatives you want to run, all the thoughts and ideas, um, you will be asked to focus on the membership as a whole, not just one single department. So uh, my point will be that uh, it doesn't matter what department is, it's when when the time is, is, is of an essence and um, ideas and, and thoughts and, and, and support needs to happen from one for one particular area we will focus on it when we need to and you know i'm sure that we'll, we'll work together to to make it happen um uh, yes teresa i think that's a great question and um in terms of for documentaries um I, well, i've worked on a number of documentaries myself and seen um the talent that's out there that the talent that uh, the DGC would only benefit from if we could represent them. And so I agree with everyone, what everyone has said um, in terms of incorporating that talent from directors to everyone else who works on the floor. Um, it, it only benefits the membership if we can have the talent that um, Canada is so well known for, our documentary filmmaking and have them represented by the DGC. Thank you. Uh, David, any uh, next question, please? Yeah, certainly, sir. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Kelly Diamond, who is from the Art Department Caucus. Uh, Kelly uh, writes, the DGC has released several statements in recent months in regard to the mental health and well-being of members. It's no secret that there are members in and out of the Art Department who are known for mentally and emotionally abusive behavior much of which is often dismissed with a shoulder shrug because that's just the way a person is. While their numbers are thankfully small, their impact on mental health and working environment can be huge for those who are working with them and tight deadlines along with heavy workloads exacerbate the situation. What are your ideas for making the art department and production a healthier, safer, more productive place for all members? Um, that hasn't been directed uh, to any uh, candidates specifically, but uh, I imagine that is for the art department. Well, I, I, I don't know that it's, I mean, I, I appreciate the question. I think it, it's for anybody that wishes to speak to it. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a concern that the organization, I think, has had for some time. And, you know, addressing it is always the challenge. I mean, uh, so the foundation of the organization is the collective agreement. But aside from that, just to all of you, if, if you have any thoughts on how best to, to tackle what are often delicate situations. Jason. Uh, sorry, just a muting the microphone. Um, th this, of course, is is one of the largest issue because it, it deals with with a lot of issues. Um, you know, workplace harassment, sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, racism in the workplace. Um, we unfortunately always run into that that tricky situation of most workplaces are better able to deal with um, bad behavior over a longer period of time because the workplace itself exists for a longer period of time. A lot of the rules and, 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 and mechanisms for dealing with a lot of this gets linked into the Ontario labor laws. And our problem is very often too many of our contracts finish up very quickly because it's a new, uh, uh, it's a new company year to year to year. You know, you can have the same bad behavior from someone to the same people, but if it's spread over three years, over four different workplaces, it's not viewed the same way as it would be if, um, you know, we were one permanent company that lasted for years and years and years. Like say example would be within the staff of the DGC office, that's permanent. And I remember at our Ontario AGM two years ago, we had talked about 
you know, how can we better relate the industry to, to the modern means? And that's not just, um, unfortunately, DDC member to DDC member. That's actually easier to deal with because you can't bring, um, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't bring charges internally within our DGC uh, contract amongst members. It also gets complicated when you're dealing with uh, Americans coming in from overseas. Uh, when you're dealing with a lot of above the line, like us as ADs deal a lot with, with actors who will use and abuse us, but they're Americans who come in and then they're gone. Um, and very often part of the problem is we get it from the other unions as well. But also um, the contracts are so short and in a busy situation like it's been the past number of years, very often it's so easy for someone just to, I don't want to put up with it anymore, so I'm just going to quit and I'm on another show on Monday. That means that we as an industry cannot solve these problems. You know, um, it was brought up at the National AGM uh, last month that very often um, a harassment charge doesn't even get um, uh, put in until after the show's done, when people have thought about it, after they don't need to work with that person anymore. It is so hard to investigate and deal with that. Um, but the right steps are starting to be made with new members who all have to go through any harassment training. You know, when you can start uh, right from the bottom, people's introduction and get them into that right mindset about things. So a lot of younger members are more likely to actually go through the proper HR chain and you know, file that um, as well too as better training supervisors so that when someone who I'm supervising comes to me legally, I have to bring that forward and I have to ensure that they're protected and it gets notified, you know, through the right chain. So the steps are, are happening, but I think the real biggest problem for us is that fact that the continuity is the unions and the people, not the workplace setting itself. And that's what we have to change. And that's unfortunately very hard to change. Thanks, uh, Jason. Um, okay, uh, da uh, uh, David, another question then, please. Yeah, um, absolutely. This is uh, quick and directed to uh, Con Quatch specifically uh, from Chris Penna, first assistant art director. Con, would you give an example of how the Masterclass series will work? Thanks for your question. Uh, uh, sorry, so thank you for your question here, Chris. And um, I'm just reading it down the list here and I saw a risk question as well. Um, in regards to, um, I'm just going to read out uh, his question because it's, it's relatable to Chris's. Uh, do all the candidates, in light of the current situation, some feel there's an opportunity for Ontario to lead the way in new technologies for TV and filmmaking, such as virtual production? How will you, as a represent representative, help promote the use of new technology and techniques, as well as training and support that, that comes with it? So. Uh, I have been working, I've been discussing this with Stephanie Katrumpas, who is one of the set designers in our guild. Uh, she actually has an amazing set design fundamental course that she taught last year along with Sonia. And we've been discussing and planning to build upon and expand uh, from that course into drafting 3D modeling with new software to keep up with the current technology. Uh, for instance, Unreal Engine, uh, Blender, ZBrush, and so on. Um, you know, certainly Unreal Engine has been making uh, quite a wave these past couple months. And I think as a guild, as an international uh, labor union, I think we need to, uh, to be ahead of the curve for sure. Thanks. Quan, thank you. Uh, David. Yeah, and, uh, and forgive me, Alan, just in the interests of fairness and some airtime, if anyone else would like to address uh, Kelly Diamond's question earlier uh, that we had, I think we should maybe uh, open it up a little bit. If, uh, if anyone does have that opportunity. You want to just repeat Kelly's question or Quan, Quan just go for it? Yeah, I, so I think there's a leadership course that has been offered, that's been offered by the guild, but it's not really available yet. Um, I mean, I was going to take it because I'm working as, as an art director now, but I haven't officially made the jump, uh, but it was offered on a Wednesday and I just saw the job this week. So it'd be great if it could be made more available for, for the members. Um, and not just for members who's going from first to art director, because I think when you're first, you're somewhat a manager within your own right. If you have a big set to, to deal with, uh, you certainly have seconds or training working under you to help bring the set together. So I think it would be beneficial for every member truly um, for that course. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Teresa. Yeah, I, Con, I, I actually took that leadership course. I took a couple of them um, as I was 
emerging and wanting to become a production manager. And I think that those kinds of courses are really important um, as part of the mentorship and part of the programming that we offer to Guild members. And that helps in terms of identifying um, abuse as it happens and elevating allies within departments so that when you look around, you're not the only one feeling you're isolated by an abusive um, department head. So those kinds of training, I strongly advocate for. We already have it um, and offering it as part of the um, upgrading process of members, I think will be really beneficial and has helped and will continue to help. Teresa, thank you. Um, um, can I jump in on that question as well? Yeah. Well, um, this is something um, that I, I feel very strongly around and just in terms of both like set life, but outside of set as well. And I don't know if this is possible. And this is one of those, you know, I think uh, initiatives that I would love to further build, um, whether as your second vice chair or just as a DGC member around like this idea of like, how do we, how do we protect the people that come forward? How do we make sure that they don't get ostracized by, you know, whispers happening, being like, oh, don't work with that person because they felt uncomfortable with these things or those things impact the reasons of why anyone wants to talk about it within their own, you know, within their own work groups or outside or bigger, or it's the first time on set. Um, and so for me, I wanted to, I've always thought about, you know, we have reps on set on some of these big, you know, bigger TV shows. We have a DGC rep that's there or assigned rep that people can go to and talk to, or at least know that they're being heard. However, I think we need to do more than that. I do think that we need to talk about how do we make productions accountable to actually hire somebody where they are allowed to be the anonymous uh, tip receiver of, of, of conversation so that people do feel safe to talk to that person and not feel that they will be ousted. Um, that they're, and it's someone that isn't from the DGC and it isn't from you know, uh, the production staff, but actually someone from the outside. And I think that that can at least start bridging that way of having um, real like, a path where people feel safe. I think safety matters. I think that we cannot feel, we cannot think that we have to be super strong, otherwise people won't hire us, so we gotta keep quiet. I think it's really important to create that safety. I think we will see so many more people thrive up um, and be held up if we can create those dynamics. And I, I think that we can make productions accountable for that and to create those safeties, safety measures for everybody. Well said, Tiffany. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, David, you've got, I'm just looking at the, the Q&A. There's questions, I, I think, one from Paul Day, one from uh, Eve Canizo that, that you may want to address unless you've got something else lined up there. No, Alan, um, your, your mind's aligned with mine. So I was going to ask Paul Day's question next. So uh, Paul Day asks of Annie, Luis, and Tiffany. An incredible amount of work in the past few years by Hans and Catherine has increased the profile of sound and picture editors, but I would like to hear how you would grow the editing caucus in strength and unification with the rest of the guild. Mm. Um, I think that, Paul, thank you very much for that question. And uh, thank you for the acknowledgement of the work that uh, Hans and Catherine have done. Um, I think that they've really tried very hard to raise the profile. Um, and we'll continue to do so. It's not an initiative that's uh, got an end date on it, as far as I know, from the national level. Um, I think that my last couple of years on the board have illuminated um, certain challenges within the editing caucus, which I feel very strongly about. And I feel that there are resolutions for those uh, challenges, which I'm not going to go into today. But I think that um, there are there are times when Luis was talking about this, but when there are times when a, I think for a long time the editing caucus and the post production caucus was not working as much as many of the other caucuses um, because we are such a service production oriented business. And I think that you know obviously that profiling was to change the the level of of, of raise the profile of our uh, talent in this uh, in this province. And I think there more can be done to do that. Um, I also think that 
you know, understanding the challenges that exist between editors and the difference between the job of editors and sound editors um, is very important moving forward as well. And um, I, I just like, I think that we have to have an open uh, mind about a uh, solution for uh, bringing the editor's uh, focus uh, to a resolution. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, Luis? Hey, Paul, thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, when I was uh, at the Ontario board uh, a few years ago, I, I, I knew of the issues. I know that there were challenges and they can, apparently they continue to be. I'm not exactly sure what the issues are at this moment. I know in the past were very, very um, concerning. Um, some progress has been made. I personally would have to, to, to read or learn about the issues that are current rather than you know trying to show oh, I'm going to do this that and the other because I, I just need to know I, I'm, I'm a visual person once I see once I find out then I can formulate a, a, a plan and or an opinion so you know, I wish I can tell you what I would do to to enhance it but uh, I, I need to uh, research the, the the issues first before I can actually give you an honest answer. Louise fair enough. Tiffany? Thank you for your question, Paul. Actually, yes, absolutely. Hans and Catherine have done incredible initiatives out there to reach out to the editorial like department. And funny enough, actually, a good friend editor, I just found out she actually just joined the DGC. So it's phenomenal to see people that I've worked with and colleagues that are actually coming in. So the work and the steps are are being done to actually bring in new members and to build the editorial caucus up. Um, I I always I always felt like my time with the DGC and being champion as a director and having uh, not only workshops, but being having like events where your work can be spotlighted and to be able to take on uh, various master classes that can really, you know, flood the field that I'm in and that that's driving me as well. Um, and one thing that I feel like just like I talk about editors as if they're like therapists. So I really do feel like they offer so much. And they have so so much of this, I guess, knowledge and, and really I call them all, all like mother hens almost. And I do feel like having specific meetings that are just geared to listening and hearing them versus, you know, other people always talking so much around editors because editors are really great listeners to be able to open up that space for for dialogue with them and to be able to take on the opinions and suggestions and to mobilize based on their direction versus a director's direction. So I'm excited for that. And I'm excited to see um, my friend joining the DGC and I'm excited for more editors to come on board as well. Tiffany, thank you. I just want to make one, one comment because we, for, for those that maybe came in late, um, uh, Penny, Penny Charter and John Rackage, our location manager rep who is running, and Penny, who is also running um, uh, for the AD caucus. I mean, that, the two of them combine to be a huge part of our membership, the production community. And um, for those of you that are watching that are within the location caucus or within the uh, AD caucus, um, don't feel that any questions that you have uh, are, are, are in any way being dismissed uh, or not brought forward, uh, and, and, but they certainly can be brought forward directly to the, those two reps. Or you can speak to, um, you know, if, if you have a question and a concern about production, because decisions that get made on the board are not made by the editorial rep, are not made by the chair, are not made by the art department rep. There are a dozen people on the board and there will be a discussion. Uh, every single issue that comes up is a discussion at the board level. Um, and, and, and until generally we find some kind of consensus that, that we can all support. So it, it's, so everybody that ends up on the board needs to be sensitive to the issues of the entire membership and they're different. Director's concerns are different. Uh, the PA concerns are different. The AD locations, the art department, uh, you, know, you guys have mentioned that the art department is the largest uh, um, caucus out there, but there is great anxiety within the production community as we move forward, trying to figure out how we, that community will actually work on the floor. So it just, I just say that to everybody. It's though we are speak, we, we have not touched on those two areas, uh, you know, directly. Uh, they are, they are areas that the, that you will all have to address. Whoever ends up on the board, you will be addressing the concerns of all members because the discussions at the board table generally are 
global discussions. What do we do? What's in the best interest of the entire membership moving forward? Knowing that every caucus has a different, the editorial caucus has got concerns. Um, the art department membership has concerns. The PMs have, everybody's got concerns. So, but, and the board, the biggest challenge at the board level and having chaired say 10 different boards over my tenure at the Guild, the biggest challenge for all the people that end up on the board is being able to take that hat off, your director hat off or your art department hat off or your PM hat off. Because uh, when you sit at the board, you are representing 3000 people. You are not sitting at the board representing the largest caucus, i.e. the art department caucus. Hi, Alan. Sorry, I don't have a, a wagging finger to-, uh, to Okay, sorry, but, but, that's, but thank you very much. Go ahead, David. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so just jumping back up the ladder of questions, I want to make sure that uh, um, we include everyone who uh, asked earlier questions. This is from Lisa Cowan. Uh, Lisa Cowan asks, uh, does the caucus rep form at their discretion committees and research groups for the caucus? And if so, these groups, do these group groups change with each representative? Uh, if that's the case, I'd like to ask whether each art candidate would be open to forming a research and advocacy committee to follow up on the issue of more flexible work hours. And uh, again, so directed at the art department. Uh, Glenn. Uh, as far as I know, uh, yeah, every time there's a new rep, the, the, there's new groups and uh, that get together and, and debate or research uh, different things that the caucus or the, the people, uh, the, the, the group in the caucus might want uh, to look into. Uh, definitely would be something I've been wanting to look at flexible hours or less hours for many, many years. Always thought that 12 hours in the art department is crazy. Uh, be staring at a, especially as a set designer, staring at a, or a graphic designer, staring at a screen for 12 hours is just, not smart uh, for health for your health for your brain and everything so definitely something i would look into uh and again going back to the health uh mental health thing too having sorry i'm going to answer kelly diamond's question slowly uh, quickly uh I, i've been in many many situations uh with uh, uh people that uh, either under me or over me uh, uh, have had mental health uh, issues and, and either create stress for the crew or vice versa and uh, I've always, uh, especially people overhead, I've always seen that they get sent to the um, DGC eventually and seem to get a slap on the hand. That's my interpretation of it. Um, I definitely want to change or see how we can change that, uh, be a bit more um, uh, aggressive with it. Uh, maybe aggressive is the wrong word, but just bring, be, be more forceful or, or make a point out of the, uh, that is bad behavior. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. Okay, Glenn. Marion, I think you, yeah. Yeah, I think in response to Lisa's question, um, it, I mean, I don't know the rules of, of the committee with the caucus. I don't really see why committees have to disband just because the caucus rep changes, to be honest, but maybe some, Alan, you know, but um, that said, I think in term, rather than looking only to the caucus rep, to form a committee that is discussing and researching something that is of concern or interest to you. I mean, I, I mean, as Khan has done, as, as referred to the group that he's um, part of, where they're looking into um, shorter days and what else is that? And, and pay structure, right? I think that those are valuable things to look into and whether your concern about flexible hours could be annexed to that concern as part of that committee, it, that I mean, it just seems like it's it's an initiative that is a is a caucus member. You can form you can suggest forming a committee. You don't have to wait for the caucus rep to form it. That's that that would be my take. I could be wrong. Uh, I've been a caucus rep, but it just seems that if there are if there are issues of concern, then take the initiative as Con and his gang have done and start discussing it and researching it. So and then and then and look to the caucus rep to you know help take that to the board for further discussion or the rest of the guild, so. Right, and I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason that, that within a caucus that, that um, you know, let's say subcommittees within that caucus cannot be established. But if the committees of the board are, are uh, discussed at the board level and it is the chair of the board that creates a committee, like the BIPOC committee at the national level was, 
was d discussed, but created officially by our national president, Tim Southern. And, and that's the same case. So if, if there was a, a desire uh, for uh, the DGC Ontario and our, and our uh, chair of Ontario to create a, 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 a global committee within covering all, all caucuses, excluding directors, I, I would suggest, because they work through the NDD, to discuss hours of work and compensation um, that everybody feeds into. Because ultimately, these committees, though they're, the, they're valuable, the decisions are still made by the board. So everything has to filter to the elected board, and then the board will make a decision moving forward. But the individual caucuses can initiate the discussion with the, for a committee. Oh, absolutely, I think, yes. yes. So that, just again, as Khan's group is doing now, any number of issues could be initiated at the caucus level. Yes. Um, uh, Annie and then uh, Jason? Yeah, and I think I think to further that, you know, since we are going into a year um, of uh, negotiations in 2021, um, you know, it's been my belief that every caucus should have a working committee that deals with the issues that are specific to that working to that caucus and absolutely have a strong voice that they can then come to the board with. And if there are parallels, overlaps, et cetera, which there are many people that are talking about a work-life balance and uh, potentially shortened hours, et cetera, then maybe there will be overlap and maybe the committees can all get together beforehand or have a separate subcommittee to deal with those kinds of things. Because I think every caucus, I mean, art department works very differently than first ADs, you know, than the AD caucus does in locations, et cetera. So I think, it's, it's very important to have the specificity of each caucus in regards to what they want um, going forward into the negotiation. So I would expect to have a working committee on in each caucus for that. Thanks, Annie. So one comment from Jason, and then we are gonna move on. There's about seven more questions that are lined up here and we only have 15, 20 minutes. So Jason, your comment on this subject. Yeah, I was just basically gonna say, yes, it, it does ebb and flow based on who your caucus rep is, but it also does ebb and flow based on how busy we all are. Because right now there's a, a lot of involvement with um, this discussion. I know we're gonna have a lot of involvement in the election, but that's because people really aren't busy and working right now. When I was the, uh, my last term as the AD rep, uh, our contract um, started January 1st. By January 12th, I had my contract committee up and running and we met every six weeks for the two previous two years um, to put together our package. And how I ran that was I had kind of two co-chairs that I was looking to take that lead because as the rep, you can't do it all, we're too busy, um, you know, between uh, regular board meetings to gap intake, to, to this, to this, to this. And so it only works if the members keep persistent with their involvement. And like I always believed in having a standing committee that does overlap. Um, as soon as, you know, when you have a new rep in, otherwise the stuff dies off and, you know, you need to keep the persistence and the momentum with it. So standing committees are good, but again, it comes down to we're standing up uh, for election, but we also need the membership to now stand up and populate that. Cause I remember one contract committee meeting where there was myself and one other person, you know, and it wasn't a very effective meeting that way, but again, we're busy. So you know, that's and, what I, you have to and I think, and I think, Jason, if there's anything that the board has learned over the last six months, that the beauty of Zoom has enabled many more conversations yeah. while people are working, because many there are a group of our board members that have been working throughout this, including yeah. myself. So I think it's it's there are new technologies that are going to help raise the level of engagement and availability of people to 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 commit to it. So I think uh, and maybe maybe, maybe the board puts together a full blueprint for how each caucus should go from now. And as well too is even those caucuses do include the five senior officers as well because you get the different uh, viewpoint on things. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, bring up another question there for us, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, a question from Reese York, and Reese is asking to all the candidates, in light of the current situation, some feel there's an opportunity for Ontario to lead the way in new technologies for TV filmmaking, such as virtual production. How will you as a representative help promote the use of new technology and techniques, as well as the training and support that comes with it? Wow. Uh, uh, um, Teresa. That's a really great question. Um, I. When I started uh, as an APM, um, I was tasked with running a shoot uh, on motion capture. And 
when I saw the technology that that took and the new personnel and the new ways of being, um, my eyes were opened and I've been doing a lot of research on all sorts of new technology since. And I think um, expanding that kind of training will only uh, allow the guild to encompass more talent in that fashion, whether it be art department in post-production. I know VisFX is a new thing that um, the guild is trying to encompass as well, um, if they haven't already. But that's also part of the cross promotion of departmental training. And I think, you know, having myself done that across the board, um, I find it really helpful, even knowing what your other fe fellow guild members are doing and um, understanding. So I'm, I'm hoping that through training and through the membership training, um, we can deal with that. Teresa, thank you. Um, David. Yeah, certainly. Um, so we have a question from Eve Knizzo, and forgive the pronunciation of your last name, Eve. Eve is asking Annie, um, how will you bring in change to have more gender equality in hiring within the DGC? The numbers between men and women or other identities is concerning, especially these days. Eve, thank you very much for the question. Are you talking specifically in regards to directors or are you talking about membership in general? That's what I'd like to know. So um, I will talk a little bit about, I don't have exact figures, but I can tell you that the numbers in episodic television for gender parity are definitely on the rise. And there has been great strides made in that. Um, in the lower budget uh, aspects of feature films, absolutely in the $250,000 and under, or I'd say $500,000 and under, definitely documentaries. There is a strong female and gender parity presence. As a matter of fact, probably a stronger female presence. Um, in regards to um, uh, feature films in the higher levels, uh, not so much. Um, Telefilm is completely aware of this and um, undergoing their own uh, renaissance, shall we call it. Um, at the current time, but we've, I've actually was on a committee with Dave Forger from National um, a year and a half ago that was uh, at the table with Telefilm to talk about their, um, their gender parity initiatives and was part of that 2020 initiative conversation. So uh, board, let's just talk about the board. So two years ago when I was voted in on the board, the, the DGC Ontario board was the very first labor board in North America to achieve gender parity. So I feel very proud of that um, and proud of the work that everybody has done in that. Um, uh, all I can say is uh, there are a lot of initiatives across the country. Um, some of them will probably be able to, to continue in regards to a sh national shadowing program as well that Ontario, I had a big hand in creating with national. But that um, may be on hold due to COVID regulations, et cetera. So we'll ease on down the road in that. Um, but it is something that is at the heart of me. Um, and is I, I believe in diversity and inclusion across the board, so um, as well as gender parity. So uh, I'm on it. And open to any conversations that you'd like to have. Thanks for the question, Eve, and thank you, Annie. Uh, David. Uh, next question is directed to the candidates for the membership chair. How can we best reach out to cultivate and recruit the most talented, artistic, passionate people to the guild and also advance and support a balanced representation within our membership? Any specific thoughts on this? And this question is from Matt Middleton. So, Dave, Jason or Teresa? Jason. Teresa, do you want to start? <laughs> or I can start. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll say like, you're attracting two groups of people. You're attracting people who are starting fresh into the industry and you're trying to attract people who are more established, um, to move from other industries into, to where Toronto is. It, it's a very tricky industry in that, um, so much of what you get is through experience doing it as opposed to just strictly scholastic. Like as an AD, you cannot learn it in school. Um, and I think right now, um, how we've seen the, the evolution, um, specifically in the AD side change, 
um, was through forward reaching out to schools, forward reaching out to other communities, and letting them know that this is a very active industry that you can join. Because it's still an industry that unless you know people within it, there's still a lot of, of unknowns. Um, and I have been heavily involved in the AD gap intake for the longest time. And the one thing that we have very much noticed uh, in recent years is that, that um, people from a lot of groups that traditionally didn't go into ADing actually now were. And a lot of what it was, was it now became uh, okay to do that. Like before your parents would never support you going into, into the arts, whereas now they would. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of tough time going in originally um, from my dad. And the funny thing is my grandparents were in the business and he was very, very much against it. Um, so those right steps about getting into the schools, doing, um, for instance, the, the PA um, shortcut program has been, been very good. And unfortunately, COVID stopped the real good first intake of that. Um, so that's really the big thing is showing people this is a good active career to go into and you will have your protections. You know, you can let your parents know you go into this. There is the health plan. There is the retirement plan. There is the structured um, training. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have the volume of courses that, that we do now. And so targeting getting that training in has been good because you can open the door and let people join, but if you're not going to give them mechanisms to really, really thrive and to learn and to better themselves, they, they won't last. Now, the other part of that is, is how do you attract people who are already established to come in? Uh, we have to do better ties with Immigration Canada and, you know, utilize the, the missions and other places overseas to target it. Um, you know, do we outreach and go to the film schools and places overseas as well? Um, you know, that's something I've always believed in because quite frankly, the way we were last year, we didn't just need to bring in hundreds of new people from the ground up. We needed established industry professionals. And what's funny is, is there are a lot of countries worldwide, especially Southern hemisphere with the opposite seasons. Like I know for instance, Australia, South Africa, there is a bunch of people not working. Would have been great to have had them to help pad up our numbers last year. You know, and their their profession, it's exactly like our profession as well. Um, so, well Jason, let me, let's get Teresa to, to jump in here if, she, if sure. you've got something. Um, so that is a wonderful question. And I that's a question I've been tackling myself for a number of years. Um, I was a board member on the Regent Park Film Festival and a founding member of their Live It to Learn It program. And with their Live It to Learn It program, it was to outreach to um, the the youth in the in, in the uh, re, in the Regent Park community to ensure that they knew what the jobs were. That sorry, directors. They're not just directors. They're not just producers. Not just writers. You got painters. You got carpenters. You got you know all sorts of people. And so that whatever their interest is that if we can show them what opportunities there are in this industry, we can attract people who are passionate. And that's why we stay in this industry is because we're passionate about what we do. And so that's something that I've been passionate about and um, want to give back to different communities in Toronto um, to attract people. But as well, you know, that's why I was thinking of a mentorship program. Because it gives those like us who are maybe in the last 20, say 20 years um, of my career to leave a legacy and leave a legacy to those who are below me. And so those people learn by example of how to uplift those below them. It's like a, a ladder where we at the top of the ladder can lift those below us. And so that we can stand together as a very strong uh, guild and a very strong district council in Canada. Thanks, Teresa. Annie. Yeah, I just want to wait. Thank you very much, Jason and, and, and Teresa. I, I just want to build on um, a sentiment that the current board has, and I know that the the future board will have going forward. And that is, uh, this is a huge issue for us. And we have a lot of major discussions about how do we achieve membership outreach? How do we better the pipeline for people coming in? How do we work on access issues, on diversity and inclusion issues? How do we make membership more, uh, you know, you know, easier for certain uh, demographics, et cetera. So we've had a lot of conversation of this. And part of it, 
just so everybody's aware, it's a combination with national because national handles membership and access. So uh, there will be a committee that will be formed um, with the new board. Uh, it's one of our first initiatives. And a lot of this is about talking about that people don't, some people don't realize that they can't have an amazing, creative, astonishing career without the opportunity if they don't have the wherewithal to go to university. And I think part of this is also about having those people, when you say you can see it, you can be it. I know, I, I, I didn't know that I could be a female director until I saw other female directors doing the job. And I think that that's so important right now to get those people out into the schools, out into the communities, out into through our sponsorship programs to like reach that audience and say, the guild wants you. And these are the opportunities. What are you interested in? And how do we shape that? Whether they end up in our guild or whether they end up in IATSE or NABET or CAMERA or whatever it is, we want you and we want you to feel included. And that's just an initiative that I just feel incredibly strongly about. So I just had to say that. Thanks, Annie. Um, uh, Con. No, you're muted there. Hi, sorry. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to add in a quick note on, on top of that. It's, it's, um, representation has been a very important issue for me uh, over the past few years since I joined the Guild. Most of the time, I actually find myself the only person of color in the entire office, if not the entire production. I actually have set out to create a diverse art department for the for Titans, even though we have really, really, really great, talented people. Uh, we don't have enough representation within, the, well, especially I find in the Archibald Caucus. And I have been, um, well, I think that we need to reach out to more schools and institutions that have a diverse student body. Uh, and also, I think it would really help you to, to consult with different BIPOC leaders in the industry as well, like Archie Thorne, who's now the chair of the committee. Um, I am in the middle of teaming up with Natalie Youngline, who is the CEO of BIPOC and Film Television Organization, where we're hoping to create a panel with uh, BIPOC uh, arts department members just to raise awareness and representation of what we do in the industry and hope to get more people into the guild as well. Because like you said, you know, we have the, the largest caucus in the guild and there seem to be always not enough people each year, especially last year, we went through a huge surge in, in production. Um, and also I thought another way that we could help with this is just to, you know, uplift and support the members of color is by potentially um, reduce the apprentice fee because right now to join the guild is actually quite expensive. If you are a GAP member, it costs seven dollars to join um and you require all this software to join at the very beginning as, as a trainee that's very expensive like i can speak from experience autocad and 3d software are they're not free they're actually very expensive so it would help if we can have some sort of a fund to help subsidize the cost uh and help people and and make and you know just to make it attractive that it's enough for people to wanting to join um the guild and i think that would be a a great initiative as well. Thanks, Thank you. Con. Um, Tiffany, and then we'll go to another question after Tiffany. Just really quickly on adding on that, and this is something I'm very excited about, is that uh, creating that accessibility for new membership. And we're at a time right now where um, institutions, organizations, all lights are pointing to them of what they can do like real action oriented thing. And I know our organizations built on membership fees, but I think that this is, we could really take this opportunity to ask these, you know, institutions that have funds and have money and be like, how much money will you, will you, will you put towards new membership fees, new memberships for specifically BIPOC communities, um, filmmakers that want to come in, but the fees become this bit of a, a barrier and this gap. I think that that's something I'm really interested in, 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 in looking into and kind of on what Teresa and Annie said about like, um, you know, we, we can lead by example if someone sees See, see someone that looks like them, they feel like it's possible. Something that I just started doing with this documentary I'm in production right now is to actually, I created a, a, 
a bit of an observation during COVID time to allow people, allow emerging filmmakers to actually observe a documentary set from not only just pre-production or production, but all the way into post to the mix. And I think that, again, you if you, we can create just windows of opportunity, I think now with Zoom all over the place, we can reach out to more new members potential and for them to actually be able to have one-on-one -on -one discussions and ask the questions that they need to. And really often the questions that I get is, how do you survive in this industry? and how did you tell your parents <laughs> so I'm interested in all of those conversations and I think that we we have the ability to do that with technology today to to offer that support and to reach out to potential new members okay one comment Jason and then we have a final question coming up before we wrap it up yeah I was gonna say um, can we look at using the organizational support and the the mass numbers to maybe lobby all the software companies to amend say their academic pricing package to also include an apprentice package so if you are a member of a labor, labor organization like us therefore can you qualify for that cheaper pricing until you get your membership you know I don't know because again like us as APs we don't really have that outside of the scheduling software so thank you David final question here so final question uh, comes from uh, the current uh, membership chair, Joanne Barrington, and I will use a little latitude and invite all of the officer candidates along with the membership chair candidates to answer this. The leadership course has been successful, but mandatory only for those wishing to upgrade to supervisory positions. Almost all those who have taken the course comment, everyone should take this course. As membership chair or officer, would you consider finding a way to make this course mandatory for all supervisors? And do you have any thoughts on how to make that happen? Okay, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, who wants to jump in? If I can start. Okay, Teresa. Um, thanks, Joanne. That's a, that is a big question, but it's a question I've been thinking about for a long time because I have taken those courses. And you're right, everyone should. Um, I think also anyone who is looking to upgrade, even from a second or a third to a second or any kind of elevation um, in your capacity should be taking the courses. And that's a good signal. It's a good signal that they want to keep going and moving forward. And so, yes, I think it should be something that we offer to anyone who's interested. Um, maybe making it a little more accessible for, you know, the SAT PAs who are not as well paid as the first ADs or the second ADs who want to jump to the first ADs position. Um, and maybe even diversifying the courses so that they aren't just cookie cutters, um, something that, you know, you can get progression into as you want to upgrade. So, yeah, great question. Well, uh, uh, Luis, did you want uh, yep. to speak to that? Uh, I wanted to just mention about that. I, I, first of all, I don't understand why it's not mandatory. It should be mandatory uh, for anyone moving up, period. I think the challenge will be with those who are already on top, that have been there for a long time, they don't feel the need for it. That's where our focus should be. Because once you make it mandatory, you will have to see it no matter what. But it's those who are up above who are actually creating the problem. That's the, the actual focus we need to have. And that's the question, how do we make those people uh, understand the importance of that? Now, uh, one thing is for sure, you know, our, our membership will demand what it is that we need to learn. Uh, we also need to help them uh, understanding what the issues are at the moment. For example, just going back for a second about technology, uh, it is a big debate right now. There's a, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and speculation. Uh, to give an example, I've reached out to members of the art department to talk to them about what do you see the way we can work together in terms, for example, scouting. We're not gonna be able to all get in a van, in a van and travel together uh, or do a tech survey. How do we accomplish this? I've suggested several uh, types of uh, uh, ideas and no one seems to have a consensus right now yet. Uh, I've been part of a conversation with uh, location managers around the world as to what they're doing in order for, for me to be able to bring something to the table. Now, this is something that should be coming also from each and every single department. Every department knows what they need and how to integrate it with others. And so if we, the members, do not bring those ideas forward, then how do we actually make it happen, right? Thanks, Luis. Uh, Naz and then Mary. 
Um, just to say a couple of things, uh, what Luis touch, uh, touched on is, is what I agree with him is like people above who, who think they're established in the positions should definitely take the, the leadership course because I agree like some of the problems that I've run into in the past has been with people who've been in the industry for a really, really long time and they think they're untouchable and you know, you, you want to speak up and say something and you're like, well, usually that is the person I would talk to to resolve my issue, but that doesn't happen, that, that can't happen. And then what's my next course? And I don't want, I want to resolve it at the production level before having to take it somewhere else. So by doing, by making, uh, making this course mandatory, I think we can solve a lot of problems, hopefully down the line. And um, in terms of technology, uh, this kind of touches on what Reese was asking earlier is that, um, I can't remember where I saw this, but I think it's an architecture firm. Uh, in terms of new technologies that what they do is they they have um, they can go and scan an area and do a 3d scan of it and then within hours you can see a 3d model of it on your computer screen and that has helped in the past to um, you know figure out where you can park your unit and where the shot is going to be and how that's going to happen like where everything's going to be even before you step into a location and the accuracy of it is crazy um, uh, spot on. So um, they're just, you know, maybe reaching out to architecture firms and see what they do in order to expedite their survey of a location and maybe bring that technology into the art department. That could be something we could do. And, you know, sometimes the real world people have, you know, ways that, you know, sometimes you don't come across it because we're just in our make believe like movie making and, you know, we're not necessarily exposed to certain technology. So Oh yeah, there's Reese saying um, he used the 3D scanning technology back in 2017. Yeah, I, I can't remember where I where I learned about this, and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. We have to do this because, you know, especially because of COVID. You know, if we can do a 3D scan of an environment without having to step into the space, that would be amazing. Anyway. Thank you, Glenn. Um, it's actually something that the COVID-19 art group already started talking about to talk and we've started talking to locations about possible to John rock uh, about possible ways of doing that sort of technology. Uh, so it, it's already in the works. We're already uh, some of us already start to do start to uh, do the, these cross uh, uh, talks with the other departments on how we can make this safer, easier and better for everyone. Okay, one final comment from Naz and, uh, and then Annie. Uh, just another thing in terms of uh, like raising awareness to technology because um, one thing I've seen a lot and I don't know if the DGC, there's a Facebook uh, art department group uh, that I'm a part of. There's actually several of them, but I'm a part of a couple of them. And, uh, you know, occasionally I see members posting, uh, you know, there's an Unreal Engine Festival happening or, you know, events that are happening that you know the DGC may not know about and I think one thing we can do as members is if we learn of an event that would be beneficial to the whole industry or just the art department we should notify the guild and maybe that could be um, published in the newsletters weekly and you know that's something members can do to promote more events in our industry because I don't know if a lot of people knew about that festival but anyway just a thought. Thank you. No shortage of thoughts, Naz. No thought. Uh, Annie, you're, you're muted. Guys, I just wanted to reiterate my support of mandatory leadership training. And I think that if there's nothing that we have not learned from this past year, that the old ways of potentially doing things, I think everybody said, when is it going to get back to normal? And I don't think that it is going to get back to normal, nor should it get back to normal because, you know, the world wasn't in such a great place before COVID happened. And I think that through the social justice movement that we've witnessed and other things, we've seen the ways of working might not be the best ways. So I think that if we, in the spirit of listening and learning, we look at our membership and say, listen, you can always, you know, change your skills, get a tune up. Um, maybe you find a way to approach things in a different way because the world is changing and leadership isn't the same anymore. And I think that this could be a, a, a way to encourage our membership is if you want to be hired in this new world, it wouldn't hurt you to take the course. You might learn something. 
astonishing and you might learn something that changes your life. So I would like everybody to take the course and tr to try and I'd like, I'd like us to move forward and try and find a way to have that offered to everybody, especially our members that are already in a leadership position. I think it would help with a lot of our issues. Um, thank you, everybody. And thank you uh, for, for this still. There's 85 people still out there paying attention to you. I mean, we, I think we peaked at about 127, but it's, you know, we've, we've stuck around 90 most of the evening here. So um, thank you all who are out there and have taken the time to, to uh, uh, be a part of this event. And uh, I think that there's, as you, as you can all have, as you've all heard, there's no shortage of ideas. There's no shortage of good ideas how we execute it, how the board moving forward um, uh, can execute, uh, execute uh, new ideas, new changes. Um, having been a part of this organization a long time, it, it's, it's not simple um, because we're a democratic organization. And so it's all about trying to get consensus from the ground up, get everybody engaged in an issue. You want mandatory training, then everybody's got to buy in and then you have to figure out how do you do that? How do you, you know, and, and so, um, I just encourage everybody to continue the dialogue, whether you end up on the board or not, hopefully all the faces that I'm looking at here are, are, are gonna be faces that are gonna be at, people that are gonna be active uh, moving forward one way or the other, and I suspect that that is the case. Um, so just a reminder to everybody out there, August 8th is the AGM. I'm counting the minutes until that day, and uh, I, I hope to see uh, all of you there and hundreds more uh, on the 8th. Um, so this is a, an exciting time for the organization and on a lot of fronts and, and many of the issues haven't even been addressed. The initiatives that the Guild is, is engaged in, one of which the most exciting one in recent times is the, is the new home that we, we hope to be into. We're gonna be in there uh, on 65 Heward Street in um, probably not moving until December, but it's gonna be an exciting space and, and, a, and a home for the entire membership and that we can showcase to the industry and be proud of who we are and what we do. Uh, and uh, continue to raise the profile of all of us it is only good um, uh, for the guild and it's good for the industry and all our membership. So thank you everybody, good night. Thank you, uh, David and the staff that behind the Iron Curtain behind me uh, that have been uh, uh, puppeteering this event. Thank you very much, all of you. And uh, we shall see you August 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Right. Good night.